Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming. This is our second to last of the review sessions for the comps. Um, so there's going to be the last one in two weeks about the Rorschach. Um, like projective tests take about 25% of, of the comps. And of that, actually, um, like probably most of that is going to be the Rorschach, but it's still, you know, there's, we'll talk about the issues of how to prepare for the part on the other projective tests. And we wanted to give the Rorschach a full like three hours because there's just a lot more um, that you have to know about that. Um, so we'll go on for maybe about like an hour and 15 minutes, take a break, and then we'll, we'll do the rest. So if, there, and if there's any questions that, that come up, please let me know. So first thing that I feel like I need to say at the beginning of every one of these is that don't assume that I'm going to go over everything that you need to know for the comps. Um, I don't make the comps. I don't see them. I uh, repressed everything that happened in the comps that I took. So I don't actually um, can't cater it exactly to what you actually will need to know. Um, also, like I, you know, my interests and whatever I pay more attention to is more heavily reflected. And also, everything that I'm saying is based on my own knowledge and my own research, and not it hasn't been approved by um, Dr. Michaels or anybody in the faculty. So if it conflicts with anything you've heard from them, go with what they say or ask me about it. So um, we're going to talk about projective tests. And I assume that you've all done at least one projective test of each type, actually. Is that, is that accurate? So um, and you know that there's um, it's not like the MMPI where like you have to know certain scales because usually the um, it's a little more subjective the nature of projective tests. Um, there is a lot of mixed research about that, saying well this reflects something, and then another research another piece of research will say well well it more reflects this other construct. So that that's that's really important to know because there's no set interpretation for any of these. There's a lot of different interpretations a lot of different systems, and uh, because of that, this is something that it's hard for them to test in the comps. So what they're going to be focusing m more on is general knowledge about the tests and uh, sort of the theory behind projective testing, and that's what I'm going to focus on more. Also, because, um, um, let's see, the way we split up the information, um, we're go I'm going to go over the brief symptom inventories. Um, which, again, I'm assuming that most of you have some knowledge about. So um, this is an overview of what I'm going to go over today. So we're going to go over sort of the theory of projective uh, projection, what the types of projective tests are, what sort of things we look at, and then we're going to spend most of my time with the TAT, the thematic apperception test. This is just based on sort of not really my own preference about it, but because that's one that um, the core concept list says you have to know more in depth. So I'll talk about the theory of it, a little bit about the interpretation. Then I'll talk about other variants of the TAT, like the CAT and the SAT, so the children's version and the older adult version. Then I'll talk about the Roberts, the Tamas, a little bit about drawings, and then um, we'll jump into just brief things about the symptom inventory. Are there any questions thus far? Okay. So, the theory behind projective tests. And projective tests are some of like the older, older tests that are, can you, am I blocking everyone? Can you see the board? And also, all these slides are on Moodle in the, um, under my name in the tutoring section. All these slides as well as other material to help you study for the comps. Um, so not under the Patel section of the Moodle? No, it's not. In, tutoring specifically? In the, in the tutoring. So where you would go to sign up for hours with any of the, any of the tutors. Okay. There's my name there and a bunch of resources there. And uh, these slides are there already. Sorry, sorry Manny. Is your way to get the PowerPoint on that as well? I have difficulty seeing. 
Yeah, there's a sort of block in the butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sorry. He's wondering if we can put it on that screen over there. Oh. Um. Or maybe on both. Mm -hmm. well, um, until we get that, I'll just keep going. Um, so projective tests are some of the older types of tests. Um, whereas, well, together with, with IQ tests. IQ tests were done at like two centuries ago uh, for pr uh, placement. Projective tests have more their their background in... Oh, it's, it's there already. Um, <laughs> like sort of psychoanalytic theory based on the idea that <clears throat> when presented with some sort of ambiguous stimuli, people will project or people will put their own conflicts un or unconscious conflicts into it. Uh, so their, inter their interpretations that they give are going to be related to what's going on for them. Um, so in essence, like the nature of projective tests are your people are presented with ambiguous stimuli and they're purported that like whatever's going on for the individual will come out. Um, and that's, there are different types of ambiguous stimuli and we'll go over that. Um, rejection was first formulated by Freud um, as a defense mechanism. So it's a way of um, sort of avo like things that are not acceptable to one, they, it, they go, um, they're repressed and then they come out in different more subtle ways. What this means is that a lot of uh, projective tests are a way of getting at what individuals aren't expressly aware of. So whereas for the MMPI um, or other objective tests, it's, it can be fairly clear what construct they're measuring. Projective tests are really too ambiguous to measure something specific. So a test will measure probably, um, might bring out things that the individual is not fully consciously aware of. And uh, that's a lot of their utility. Um, another, th uh, other things that have to do with like the theory of projection is that people assign subjective phenomena to things that are objective. So they'll, and this has to do also with like the cognitive aspect of it. Like people will make assumptions, fill in the gaps in order to do that. Um, so Freud said that projection is a process whereby all contemporary meaningful perception is predicated on and organized by the memory traces of all previous perceptions. So what he's saying that there is that we use our own experiences to interpret things in our, in our world. Um, Belak, who um, I'll talk a lot more about him, he did a lot of work on the TAT, and in fact, probably is the most authoritative source on the TAT, uh, looked at the concept of apperceptive distortion. Apperceptive distortion is um, sort of what happens when people look at some sort of stimuli and they l look at it with their own biases in it. So they distort objective reality to match what's going on internally for them. And um, as you can tell, like it's a concept of apperceptive distortion is sort of the core thing of what we're looking at in apperceptive tests, such as uh, the TAT. Um, hashing this out a little further, um, so the theory behind projective tests is that different types of stimuli will have a different response from the test taker. So uh, they tend to be a way of looking for meaning, conflict, and as conscious processes um, that come out sort of very naturally in the unconscious way that people perceive their world. Um, and as I said before, people are often unaware of the latent meaning of what they're projecting onto these stimuli. So whereas, um, they might be aware of what they're saying, like, oh, this is a child that uh, is having, uh, his father is making him play the violin and he really doesn't want to, what he wants to do is go play outside. Um, the meaning, it, what can come up for us when we look at that might be issues with power figures, authority, family conflict, uh, desire, motivation. And those are things that people are, are actually often not aware of. Um, Something else is that um, there are different approaches to this. Uh, there are nomothetic approaches, which are a little bit closer to what the MMPI does. It says, this is what this measures. It sort of fits into a bucket of pre-existing things. 
and there's ideographic approaches, which are based more on what the individual actually does. Um, so, for instance, not about testing, but in general to clarify the difference between these two things, sort of in CBT, there's a nomothetic formulation for disorders that say, like, this is what, you know, people with OCD, this is the mechanism that brings it about, this is what happens. Uh, and that often sort of tries to generalize and get rid of individual differences, whereas an ideographic approach would be more client-centered, client-focused. And what's important is that a lot of times people see projective tests as being only ide ideographic, like it's, only, it's all about the individual, but that's actually not true. Um, for instance, we can see that for the Rorschach, which we'll talk about in two weeks, like it's actually um, quite a nomothetic approach. It's saying this is what people that have a lot of space responses tend to be like. Um, but so different projective tests bring out these two approaches. And it's important as for us to be able to use both depending on the test or use them both in concert. Are there any questions so far? So keeping in mind that um, projective tests will often, we can use it both nomothetic and ideographic approaches, um, there are different things that we look at when we look at a person's responses um, to this ambiguous stimuli. So the first thing is a content interpretation. It's like what the examinee is actually saying. Um, so are they talking a lot about like a particular theme like that they, they're just stuck on? Um, for instance, if people that have trauma, is everything about their trauma being related to that? It's like, oh, this reminds me of... Um, like Iraq, for instance, in, in the case of a, a veteran with PTSD. Um, it's very clear. It's sort of the first order, most easy to interpret. Uh, so content interpretation. There's also uh, the next level is the expressive and structural aspects of the response. So that's, um, are they trailing off? Are they losing touch with what they're, they're talking about? So um, for the TAT, for instance, are they just saying oh, it's, um, it's a little boy having a dream about a surgery, or is it talking about the person's wishes and they're just going on and on and rambling, and at some point they just fall off the um, drawing. Like all of a sudden they start talking about um, what the boy did like three days and what he had for breakfast, and like things that are just completely not that necessarily related, and it's, that's really important. That can tell you a lot about a person's thought process. Um, the next level of interpretation is the gestalt function, functions. Um, it's like how the examinee is able to put things together. So um, it's a blot, it's also a drawing, um, like, are they able, how are they able to synthesize different sources of information? That's actually used a lot less, but I won't go into that. Um, the next le uh, category of study is about self-image or body image. So it's um, what, about what types of themes of concerning self-perception are put on the blots. And here we're going a little bit more into more the latent meaning of whatever they're saying. And Manny, please correct me if I say something that's not fully accurate. Um, and then the last one, I think, yes, is uh, methods of preference. So what choices are being made? Um, that comes out a lot more in things like the Rorschach, where, as I'll talk about in a couple of weeks, uh, it can be seen as a choice, uh, more, less of a projective test and more as, you know, what choices are being made. There are many, many different things that you can say about a blot, uh, a Rorschach blot, but you make a, you choose to answer in a certain way. You choose to give a whole response, you, that, and then you go into like a detailed response. And because these are fairly ambiguous things, you can always choose to say or not say a lot of things. So looking at what choices are being made for the examinee is sort of the last of these levels. Um, this uh, this information comes from. Um, the, I, I think it's the essentials of TAT and projective storytelling. Any questions about this? Again, for the, 
uh, for the comps, you, you don't need to necessarily have a very, very in-depth uh, understanding of this, just in general. What are the types of things that come up in projective tests and what are the ways that you would interpret it? So going further with, with this theory part, and I promise I think we're almost done, um, is that there's a difference between the manifest and the latent content. Manifest content is what they actually say, what's very clear. Uh, latent, and this all goes back to Freud, latent content is what they're not saying, but they're still projecting onto it. So um, certain, certain themes, certain anxieties. So um, we, in order to get to the latent content, we often have to go a little bit beyond just what the examinee is saying. And uh, the psychoanalytic theory is that the ego is a mediator between the manifest and the latent content. It's sort of the gatekeeper that allows all these repressed anxieties to come out. Um, so we can, we can look at projective tests really from both the psychoanalytic perspective, which is the way it's been traditionally done, but also from a more cognitive science perspective, which has to do with the way people perceive things and the way that we just like envision or forms the way we put things together. As I said before, there are, really there are a lot of issues with the validity of projective tests. Interpretation tends to be fairly subjective, even if we try to make it somehow not. Um, <coughs> but um, there are different way, bases for interpretation. The first being sort of like normative or statistical aspect of these. And actually most of the projective tests that have been developed there's more of a push to make them more and more objective so that they can get more validity. So the Rorschach is the best example of this, where there was like a ton of different very subjective systems and then Axner came on and said, no, I want to get a sample of thousands of people and actually uh, get means and standard deviations for types of responses. Um, also, we can see that with the Roberts or with the Tamas, where if you follow the protocol for scoring, you can also get norms about different, what people that answer in a certain way tend to have as their latent content. Um, usually that is seen as having a higher validity, but um, I would disagree with that. Um, the next base of interpretation is content analysis. And that's uh, kind of more of what most psychologists do when they give a projective test, except for the Rorschach, which has to do with um, looking at the different responses um, to the stories, looking at different responses to different things, and then trying to extract themes. So a lot of it is similar to the content analysis done in research where there's a lot of information and it's up to us to sort of extract things that are a little more hidden, more like patterns that you see. It's like, wow, look at... Um, how all of these responses to the temas have very quick magical resolutions but in, that are very negative. And that's a pattern amongst all of this. Interesting, what might that mean about the latent content for the individual? Or um, like more personality factors. Uh, the next level is intratest patterns. Say you compare the RISB with the um, TAT and an objective test like the MMPI. Are there any patterns that come out between tests? Are there any discrepancies that, that come out? Often something that we see a lot is that we see a, a very um, normal or boring, you could say, profile on the MMPI, but then the Rorschach and the Timas are very negative and very indicative of a lot of psychopathology. And that's an interesting intratest pattern that gives you a lot of other information about people's response styles, level of insight, and um, ability to verbalize or to express a lot of their issues. Uh, and the last basis for interpretation is intra-individual comparisons. So not necessarily looking at things for the individual, but well, what sort of themes usually come out um, for a particular card in the TAT, for instance, and how did that individual respond? For instance, in one of the, and we'll go over this more, in the TAT, there's <clears throat> a card where there's a specific part that can be interpreted as being, um, you know, keys or maybe a gun, but then a lot of drug users um, actually see a hyperdermic syringe. So that's comparing how different individuals in different situations respond differently to this. Um, 
questions? Or should I keep going? So just say more a bit about, about the intra individual comparisons. I mean, you're saying that, I mean, because isn't that the entire idea of the projective test that everyone's going to have their own interpretation regardless? Right. So the question is, um, it, how, how would you use intra-test comparisons considering that um, that's kind of the point of it, to compare different people? And um, th that's true, that you would look at, bring specific things about different people into this, but um, oftentimes characteristics that are particular to that individual will come out when you compare their responses to the responses of other people. Whereas for a content uh, analysis, you're looking at only those, like themes that are consistent only within that individual responses. You're not looking at what people tend to respond. Um, so really, like, even if we're not really aware of it, what we're doing, or normally when we look at it, a test like this, even subjectively, is using a mixture of both. What stands out as being out of like non-normative compared to like what we know about the test, but also what patterns arise within the individual. Does that, did I, that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. So that was enough about theory um, until we got to the theory on the TAT. But, um, so projective testing is a huge, huge, huge um, field. That's sort of why we're giving it two different se um, sessions for this. And there are different ways that we can look, uh, categorize projective tests. One of them is by response format. Um, what we're going to talk about first are storytelling tasks, where the response format is verbal. Um, people are pr presented with a stimuli, and they're supposed to tell a story about it. Um, you could also say that uh, the Rorschach is also a verbal response format. The next one is uh, written. That's a lot less common. The only one I can think of really is um, something like the sentence completion tasks, where they're presented with you know, the beginning of a sentence and they have to complete it. They have to write it down. The third one is drawing, which uh, comes out in the, in the different projective drawings that will be talked about. And as you can see, each one will probably elicit different types of material. Um, drawings are a little bit more vague uh, in terms of their demands. You can just, within a construct, you can draw anything you want. Um, the, the written one requires more of a motor component, which can, in, and the drawing as well, they, they have a motor component which can influence that. Um, th but they're very useful for people that have a lot of um, expressive language problems. If somebody can't really speak, well, they can't really tell a story or children that might not have very de well-developed verbal skills um, or the nature of what's going on for them might be a uh, too intense for them to be able to verbalize it just because of their development. And then drawing is, for instance, a better way to get at that. Whereas, um, you know, usually for adults, because our society emphasizes um, verbal expression so much, they might be more willing to give more details. So it's important to keep in mind, you know, what the different things that might, within the individual, that might give different responses to different tests based on the response format. Um, the other thing is the type of stimuli. So um, is it either a part of a sentence that they have to complete? Is it an image that they're asked to elaborate and interpret? Or is it a, like a specific task that they have to do? For instance, like draw a person. That's the task. Um, and also, some uh, the last of the things that I think it's important to consider is, well, how ambiguous is the stimuli? Um, in the RISB, for instance, those are the sentence completion task. I mean, it, one of the sentences is uh, a mother. So it's like, well, how ambiguous is it? It's pretty clear that it's asking about things about your perception of mothers, perhaps even your own mother. Whereas the Rorschach, it's... You know, something that is completely has absolutely no, unless you have somebody that's saying like, well, it's an ink blot, everything else is like not really based on the blot, right? It's very, very ambiguous. And everything falls somewhere in between. Um, for instance, um, you know, the, even in the TAT, the RISB, let's, let, let's say, um, no, not the RISB, let's say the TEMAS, it has, say, a drawing of 
um, people shoplifting. Well, that's that's pretty clear, right? It is what it is, and there's um, it's it's pulling a very specific type of responses. And so, when looking at different types of tests as you're studying, uh, it's important to think about like, well, how open is it, and how uh, the is the stimuli, how ambiguous is it, and how is that going to influence the type of responses you get? Anything else? Questions or? So um, this is sort of a selection of, of different storytelling tasks. Um, we're going to go over essentially everything except for the Rorschach today. Um, there are uh, three sets of storytelling tasks that I'm going to talk about. So there's a thematic apperception test together with the variance, the seniors apperception uh, task, and the children's apperception test. There's Tell Me a Story um, and the Roberts too, which are more for children. The drawing task that I'm going to talk about is the house tree person, draw a person, person of the rain, and the kinetic family drawing. And then I'll talk about the, the broader incomplete sentences, and uh, in two weeks we'll devote all the time to Axner and the Rorschach.